It's always difficult to craft a good Doctor Who series finale. Just ask Chris Chibnall. There are so many things to pay off and a really blockbuster atmosphere to create. Russell T Davies always managed to achieve this in his era of the show, although some fell short in varying ways. However, it's undeniable that the biggest and most ambitious finale is the two part of The Stolen Earth and Journey's End, which brings back almost all of the main recurring characters of that era, along with familiar monsters and the very creator of the Daleks themselves, Davros. The previous finales had upped the ante each time, so realistically the next step was to create a universe ending threat to truly feel worth it, leading to the villains stealing entire planets to fuel their reality bomb weapon, ultimately requiring three doctors and countless companions to save the day and stop the Daleks for good, finally stopping this ongoing threat throughout the era. The series 4 finale is a very divisive one amongst fans, because its ambition is considered its biggest weakness. The second part heavily disliked for how it pays off the incredible first part, however when you consider how much the story had to juggle and how much it paid off, is the ambition actually worth it? Even with its shortcomings, does it serve as a satisfying conclusion to series 4 and the Russell T Davies era as a whole? Or is it just a disorganised mess that tries too hard to do too much all at once? Just beginning. The opening of Stolen Earth is admittedly a step down from the incredibly high stakes dramatic ending of Turn Left. We'd been led to believe the universe was ending and everything was doomed, but when they land in this episode everything is normal. It is worked into the story well because even the Doctor is a bit concerned about this, but it is still a letdown. It's good that we get a moment to reflect on how the Doctor is kind of excited at this chance to see Rose again, even with the doomsday scenario it entails. At the end of Turn Left he was terrified at the prospect, but he still cares deeply about her and hates how their time was cut short, so it's not surprising that he'd be happy to reunite with her, just like how the audience would be because for some absurd reason she's most people's favourite companion. Then the TARDIS ends up in the middle of space because the Earth itself has disappeared, which is a brilliant hook for the episode. Episode. Everything had seemed so normal and quiet, but suddenly the entire planet, the main setting of the show, has just vanished into thin air and even the Doctor can't explain it. He's hopeless and lost for words. This understandably makes Donna very scared and shaken by the prospect of her family and friends being dead. This is exactly why human companions are great for modern Doctor Who, because they often have something or some body back on Earth to anchor them to the setting, usually their family. I always liked how Davies incorporated these families into the companions fears and motivations. Despite Donna's hard exterior, she's a deeply compassionate character who cares a lot about the people in her life. Whilst we the audience know Wolf and Sylvia are alive, Donna doesn't. Her entire world has blinked out of existence so you can really relate to her anguish and emotional struggle here. Something very smart series 4 did was introduce and reintroduce a number of earthbound characters. It seemed normal at first but this episode more than explains why, because we suddenly cut back to earth showing another perspective, the ground view of the characters this planetary shift is affecting. We see Martha in New York, Captain Jack in Cardiff and Sarah Jane in London, all faces we recognise either from the main main series itself or the two spin-off shows airing at the same time. It's a brilliant use of Doctor Who's shared universe, bringing these characters into the fold whilst the Doctor is lost in space. I've spoken so many times before about the importance of showing the personal effects when Earth is targeted, and this is probably the best example because of how many familiar characters there are in the sequence. It's gone dark. It's them aliens, I'll bet my pension. We get to see how they react, all having a common shock regarding the sky. It culminates in that beautiful moment of Rose teleporting to the street, the camera panning up to show those planetoids in the sky. This is one of the best, most ambitious cold opens in the show, a magnificent way to introduce all these characters and establish the scope of the episode. Rose coming back isn't even the main hook for the opening, because the visual of all those planets ups the ante so dramatically and effectively. I also can't help but comment on the title sequences of this two-parter, so many names racing across the screen. Up to this point the most there had been were three, but this story just throws it out of the window and has almost a ridiculous amount. I love it, since it reflects how much ambition the story has, although it's a shame that characters like Harriet Jones and Francine are spoiled with the post-intro credits.
Another thing Davies always does very well in his stories is incorporating pop culture and news channels to reflect the wider atmosphere of events. It features heavily in pretty much every present day story he wrote, and it appears again here, using news and Richard Dawkins for exposition about how many planets there are, and that Earth travelled to them. It's a clever way to slip in important exposition, because it's so much more natural than the Doctor standing there and saying it all to Donna. However, much like the previous two finales, there are also comedic cuts to pop culture, adding levity whilst reflecting this wider impact on the mainstream world, rather than just our important characters who are desperately trying to work out what's going on. It's no surprise that the people of Earth are looting and going nuts, because if 26 planets suddenly showed up in the sky, you'd immediately think it was Armageddon. So I like the sharp contrast to how calm the TV coverage was. There's a good build up as our spin off teams find a space station mixed in with all the planets, although the more pressing issue is the 200 spaceships heading for Earth. I would say it's a bit of a letdown that I had Martha in New York and not with the unit people we met in the Santaran two-parter, but it doesn't matter too much. However, what does matter is that her phone can't call the Doctor. As we saw in 42 in the Santaran stratagem, this phone can call anywhere in the universe without fail. The latter episode a clever setup to show her direct link to the Time Lord, but it not working really adds another layer to the already stacked tension of the episode. Then comes one of my favourite moments in all of Doctor Who. But it's bittersweet because it's one of the last times the Daleks were scary. The spaceships start to send a message through, the simple Dalek catchphrase of exterminate. This leads to some good use of these familiar characters. Sarah, Jack and Martha have all had direct dealings with the monster, Jack even having been killed by one so he knows they can't be stopped. They all know what the Daleks being here means, all with those experiences of the evil of the Daleks. I said this way back when I made my original video about this story, but Elizabeth Sladen is the best part about this scene. She perfectly sells Sarah's raw fear and horror at the simple sound, choking up because she can't save her son, the most important person in her life. When she last met the Daleks, it was right at their genesis, and they weren't even defeated, just sealed inside a bunker, so she also knows how impossible it is to fight them. It goes without saying, but the music is also absolutely stellar. The dark and endless Dalek night blasting in all of its glory as the ultimate Dalek invasion begins. All these hardened and experienced heroes trembling in fear, the Doctor nowhere to be seen. Ugh, it's just the pinnacle of Daleks in New Who, the best the monsters have ever been. Their mere presence having this dramatic, horrifying effect and gravitas. It's kind of like Parting of the Ways, but turned up to 11, because this time we have so many people down on the planet. We're not distant like the characters in that story were. As the viewer, we see the action below and all the people affected as they mount their futile fight back. It is utter perfection in every sense, and I can't overstate how much I adore this sequence, especially when things like the Valiant are easily wiped out as the Daleks destroy all military locations on the planet. Because Martha is part of UNIT, she is also a target, her superior officer forcing her to use Project Indigo and giving her the mysterious Osterhagen key, which she doesn't want to take even in this desperate situation. This key is a great, sinister mystery running throughout the story, because it comes up again later when Harriet Jones orders Martha not to use it under any circumstance. Remember, this is the same woman who ordered the Massacre of the Sycorax, so her being so against this Osterhagen key says a lot. The two-parter puts Martha in a more militaristic role, almost making her more of a Torchwood 1 figure than a unit medic, because she has to kind of replicate her dangerous quest from the Series 3 finale. It's great that they have her on the phone with Jack during this invasion because he knows about Project Indigo and how risky it is. They're good friends and he's incredibly knowledgeable, so his concern and anger at her using this sells the implication that she's now dead because the teleportation is too unrefined to work. It's probably the millionth dagger to the back of the viewer, another way to beat you down and make everything more hopeless for the protagonists. However, there is a ray of hope, because Wilf clocks onto the Ice Stalk weakness, even though he just has a paintball gun. Indeed, the paint just dissolves and proves to have no effect on the Dalek. But it's all good because Rose blows it up to save them, Wilf delivering one of his best lines. Do you want to swap? Rose saving Wilf is probably one of the few good things she does, so good on you Rose. Thanks for saving our lad. I still don't like you though. But in case you thought you might at least have one brief moment of hope, Davies doubles down on the hopelessness by teasing Davros, the very creator of the Daleks themselves. 
Similar to the Master and Utopia, New Who fans wouldn't really understand how weighty this appearance is, but the episode is able to achieve that balance of introduction and reintroduction. Classic Who fans who know about Davros would be gleefully squirming in their seats at the prospect of this villain getting the New Who treatment, but it also allows New Who fans to get an understanding of his significance, especially with the brilliant theme sounding like something out of a Japanese horror movie. We then reunite with Dalek Khan, who we last saw slipping out of the Doctor's grasp in Evolution of the Daleks. However, this time Khan is a babbling and insane Dalek mutant inside his casing. This is so striking because it's such a far cry from his last appearance, where he spearheaded a mutiny against Dalek Sek, but now he is the abomination. It turns out that Khan broke through the time lock and entered the time war to save Davros losing his mind in the process. I really like this establishment because it once and for all explains why the Doctor can't just fly back and save Gallifrey. It is possible to break into the conflict, but it's too costly and dangerous, which Khan represents. Although he has become big brain, seeing all of time at once, just like Rose could when she absorbed the heart of the TARDIS. It's also through Khan that we get a lot of seeding regarding the Metacrisis Doctor and the Doctor Donna, predicting the three-way split at the end of this story. <laughs> Is coming. The free old man. This revelation of Khan rescuing Davros from the Time War is a remembrance of the power of the Daleks, this lone soldier breaking the time lock where so many others failed and allowing Davros to resurrect the Daleks, achieving his perceived destiny of creating a new, pure Dalek race from his own flesh. A new genesis for the monster. Like the Doctor said in Evolution. They survive. They always survive when I lose everything. It seems like everyone he doesn't want to have escaped the Time War has, whilst he remains alone with his guilt and anguish. Speaking of the Doctor, during all this chaos he takes Donna to the Shadow Proclamation, which had been mentioned a couple of times before but never really stated what it is. The fact that the Doctor has to go to them for help speaks volumes about how helpless he is. It's like when the second Doctor had to call on the Time Lords at the end of the War Games, reluctantly having to bow to a higher authority because they have nowhere else to turn. Visually, the location looks incredible, this unnatural asteroid formation with spires straight out of Minas Morgul. Internally, it's nothing that special, but that kind of external visual is what we need a lot more of in the show because it screams science fiction. The Jadoon showing up also furthers this ambitious crossover event by bringing back another familiar part of the show, but I mainly love this moment for Donna's bemused reaction to the Doctor conversing with the space rhinos. However, the more important conversation comes next, because the Doctor finds out just how many planets have been taken. This expands the scope for our main duo. We know how much the Time Lord loves the universe, so finding out this event is a universal crisis rather than simply another Earth crisis is the logical progression of his end of the story giving him even greater cause for concern. This scene also shouts out some familiar planets like Klom and Woman Wept. This perfectly straddles the line of keeping a massive scale without devolving into Star Wars levels of everyone and everywhere being related. We never actually saw any of these planets, they were simply mentioned in previous episodes. They called it Women Wept. The planet was actually called Women Wept. However, more importantly are the planets mentioned throughout Series 4 itself, which allow the Doctor to complete the puzzle. It's a clever story arc, throwaway lines suddenly becoming crucial. Despite what I said in my Series 2 review, I don't think this arc was too obvious. It's more of an, oh that makes sense now sort of arc. Even the lost moon of Poosh suddenly becoming relevant after an innocuous conversation in Midnight. And did they ever find it? Find what? The lost moon of Poosh. <laughs> No, not yet. Wow. I also like how the Doctor has three suspicions as to who could be behind this, none of them good. He mentions someone trying to move the Earth before, which narrows it down to either the Time Lords, who moved the planet in Trial of a Time Lord, Cybermen, who piloted Mondas in the 10th planet, and lastly the Daleks, who tried to pilot Earth in the Dalek invasion of Earth. Unless you also want to count the Captain from the Pirate Planet, but it's definitely not him. Obviously we know it's the Daleks, but he doesn't. So the fact these are the main suspects really scares him because they all should be impossible. So that truly means it would be the end of the universe. Much like the missing planets, even the vague real world references to bees disappearing becomes a crucial plot point because their migration allows the Doctor to follow the path of Earth. 
It's an unconventional plot development, but it's a good way to explain how the Doctor and Donna find where the Earth is supposed to be. Something very minor that didn't seem to matter to the wider scheme, yet kept getting brought up, just like the planets. I think it's a great turn of events when they show up at the Medusa Cascade and there's no sign of those planets. Just when they thought they had the answer, they're pegged back yet again, completely back at square one. This allows for a wonderful character moment for both the Doctor and Donna, since as she points out, he never gives up. This is a character who would go through hell without a second of hesitation if it meant there was even a chance of saving one person's life. But here, he's resigned himself to failure, without any hope or belief. The Doctor has failed. We had had previous episodes like Midnight and Science in the Library where the Doctor had lost, but it was never on this scale before, he'd at least fought until the end. Here, however, there's not even a glimmer of hope in those eyes anymore, which does a brilliant job showing how severe this all is. This colossal failure across the board as all the characters give up, crushed and hopeless without their figurehead to save them. Like the Doctor himself, they've run out of fight. Even though it's half an hour into the first part of a two-part story, it really feels like the end, a crushing defeat for the entire human race. It's the day of the Daleks now. However, just as everything seems lost, a beacon of hope calls out to our broken and dejected protagonist. None other than Harriet Jones, former Prime Minister. Yes, I know who she is. Her appearance really drives home just how much of a crossover this all is. The others were spin-off teams and companions, but Harriet on the other hand was a side character who appeared twice and was deposed from her position as Prime Minister by the Doctor himself. So it's a real deep cut to bring her back, but a welcome one. Just as welcome as the revelation that Martha Jones is still alive, much to Rose's dismay. Who's she? I want to get free. Yeah Rose, you were replaced by someone better. Take that, I'm glad you get locked out of this call, especially with your petty remarks throughout. Indeed, Martha teleported home, reuniting with her mother even at the end of the world. While the subwave network is cool and all, I'm not really sure it makes a whole lot of sense with the sentient technology seeking out people who know the Doctor. Surely there'd be a couple hundred people on this call when you consider all the companions still on Earth at this point. Also, if the AI is so powerful, that concerns me, because sentient tech never goes well in Doctor Who. And yes, I know the subwave network was funded by the Mr. Copper Foundation. Originally, Davies wanted to bring back Copper himself, but actor Clive Swift decided to be an awful person in an interview, so great job. I think it's a great touch that the plot point of Harriet being deposed comes up again here, using these events to justify her decision back then. It's clever to do this because she does have a point. She told him they couldn't always rely on him, but he still destabilised her government for simply doing what she believed was right. The Christmas invasion was a very similar situation to this. The entire planet under attack without the Doctor there to save them. They were helpless and lost. It wasn't a case of if the Doctor isn't there again, it was more when the Doctor isn't there again. Exactly what we see in this episode and Turn Left just an episode earlier. All three groups on this call died in the name of the Doctor, so as a viewer we also know Harriet is kind of right. Her presence in this episode is almost like her redemption in the eyes of the audience. The last we saw of her, she was very much presented as a monster for what she did, so this makes her a good character again, allowing her to die for the Doctor, who she still respects and forgives for what he did. Ironically, it makes her similar to him in a way. Even until the end, she wants to do what's best for her people, without caring about her own life. She puts herself in a Doctor-like role to shape this organised unit, no pun intended, allowing them to give the Doctor a signal and bring him back to Earth. In the grand scheme of things, it's Harriet Jones who saves the day, because without her, the Doctor would have never found the planets. It truly shows that hope is in the most unlikeliest of places. However, rather annoyingly, Russell T Davies later wrote a poem explaining that Harriet somehow escaped and didn't die. I think it's a huge shame because she has this redemption arc. After all that happened, she goes out like a hero, standing up to the Dalek threat and accepting her death in a really powerful scene. Especially how the pale of her recurring gag is used to show courage and strength in the face of these monsters. I know who you are. Oh, you know nothing of any human and that will be your downfall. Her death is honestly the most underrated part of this episode. No one really talks about it, but it's a really poignant piece of television, making good use out of her inclusion. Even with such a short part within the episode, it's a stellar example of great character evolution, building upon her previous appearances to redeem her. The Doctor and Donna finally break through to find all the planets, hidden a second out of time from the rest of the universe. 
It's a smart explanation for how these planets are lost in time and space, although as is typical of Doctor Who, it doesn't actually make a whole lot of sense, but we can overlook that. His virtual reunion with everyone on the subwave network is such a triumphant moment filled with hope and optimism. In spite of everything that's happening, he's just blown away to see all these friends waiting for him. So many people believing in him and pulling him across time. Even though they're begging him for help and trying to explain what's going on, he can't help but smile at how brilliant all these people are for what they've been able to accomplish even without him. It's kind of like School Reunion if it was filmed in 2020. However, despite this happy moment being all smiles and fun, Davros hijacks the call, the great creator addressing his nemesis face to face to taunt him. I love the creeping dread on the Doctor's face as he recognises the voice, this slow look of despair also shared by Sarah Jane, who met Davros all those years ago believing he'd died, but now she's having to see this sick monster again. It is simply perfect how David Tennant sells this reunion, such a drastic contrast to seeing his friends, frozen in terror, something that never happens. Like Sarah, he believed Davros was dead, destroyed in a time war in the jaws of the Nightmare Child. Lines like these show the power of Russell T Davies' world building. Such simple lines conjure up endless wonder and speculation. The Nightmare Child had me fascinated for years as I imagined some kind of Lovecraftian cosmic horror, only to find out it was just the type of Dalek. How disappointing. Armed with a newfound optimism and hope, our characters start to pick themselves back up, the Doctor heading towards Earth with Jack fixing his Vortex Manipulator to find him, although the Daleks start to close in on the Torchwood Hub and Sarah Jane is caught by the monsters. It's this weird mix of hope and terror, which kind of sums Doctor Who up in a way. It climaxes in that beautiful moment of the Doctor looking round to see his old companion, Rose's theme chiming in as they have this star-crossed reunion. Even though I don't like the Ten Rose pairing, I can't deny this moment is truly special. It's the culmination of countless episodes. Throughout Series 3 we were constantly reminded of Rose, and Series 4 showed her breaking through to find the Doctor. There's so much groundwork making this moment what it is, so it feels special no matter what what your thoughts are on the pair. However, everything comes to a screeching halt as a random Dalek passing by blasts the Doctor. Just when everything seemed to be on the up, this comes in to shatter everything. This ending is one of the absolute best moments in Doctor Who history, especially if you were fortunate enough to experience it upon broadcast. Nobody at all expected this sudden death. It was hidden so well by the production team, especially because it wasn't known yet that Tennant would be leaving the role, at least not this soon. It's clever to have Rose and Jack here during this scene because they know about regeneration, whereas Donna doesn't. Some members of the audience would be in the same shoes as the current companion, no knowledge of this Time Lord death, so having these former companions allows the episode to explain regeneration. This is the closest Doctor Who will ever get to a surprise regeneration of the main character. It's a remarkable way to close the episode, probably the the single most memorable cliffhanger in Doctor Who's long history as he shoots out those recognisable golden beams. I remember there being so much speculation in the media and among the public. Everywhere you went people were wondering what would happen in the next episode. There was such a buzz. It felt like the longest wait between episodes because there was no sign of what to expect. The anticipation was amazing and I will never forget what it was like to experience this shock as it happened. The pinnacle of Doctor Who as event television. What a final impression. However, at the beginning of Journey's End, this massive, groundbreaking cliffhanger is resolved instantly. The Doctor simply channeling all his regeneration energy into his dismembered hand, which he's been conveniently carrying around in his TARDIS since Last of the Time Lords, simply healing himself without changing. Now, a lot of people hate this, and I totally understand why. The cliffhanger was almost too ambitious and shocking for its own good, because any Anything other than a proper regeneration would have been a disappointment. It almost makes you wonder why the Doctor doesn't just cut off their hand every time they regenerate so that they can just cheat the change like this. However, I do think the solution ultimately ends up satisfactory because it becomes a major plot point, but with how the cliffhanger was set up, it's understandable that everyone reacted like, wait, that's it? Indeed, basically nothing from that cliffhanger has any consequence because everyone makes it out alive. Sarah Jane conveniently getting saved and the torture team and a time lock to save them being killed. There's an air of disappointment about how it all gets resolved, which I think accidentally sets the tone for the entire episode. The Daleks then teleport the TARDIS up to the Death Star, I mean the Crucible, with Sarah, Jackie and Mickey surrendering to follow them, essentially ending the pair's contribution to the episode because they don't really do anything after this. Mickey deserved better, man. I spoke before about Davies slipping in exposition through clever means, but here we get the opposite. Rose monologuing to the Doctor to explain everything about the Dimension Canon and the 
stars going out. I know there's a lot of lore that needs to be established for this episode, but I think it's done badly in this scene. Just a shameless exposition dump. I simply feel as though there could have been so many better ways to do this. However, I do like that when they get to the Crucible, the Doctor is forced to admit defeat. Back in Parting of the Waste, the TARDIS was invulnerable, but a quick way to tell the viewer these new Daleks are more of a threat is to remove that invulnerability, which is exactly what happens, and it achieves this purpose quite well in my opinion. There's no way for the protagonist to escape, their only option is to face the Dalek threat. So I like this marching to death, so to speak. The Doctor giving that short speech to his companions reflecting on their good times and how they were all brilliant. When you really look at it, it's a veiled admission of defeat. He has no cars up his sleeve and he knows the Daleks won't spare them. It's the end of the line, so this is a nice moment to reflect courage in the face of death itself. However, Donna hesitates to leave, allowing the TARDIS door to suddenly lock for reasons unknown to both the Doctor and the Supreme Dalek. It kind of mirrors Parting of the Ways, where neither the Time Lord nor the Emperor knew the true symbolism of Bad Wolf, instead blaming it on each other. This ultimately leads to the TARDIS being dropped into the Crucible's engine to destroy it. I love the chaos and intensity of this moment. Donna is trapped and facing certain death in what was previously the safest place in the universe, whilst the Doctor is forced to watch on powerless as his companion and precious ship burn up. The Doctor doesn't do weapons, but the TARDIS is the constant companion, all he has left of his people and there's nothing he can do to save it. The Daleks know how important it is to him, so they're asserting their dominance and pushing him to a breaking point. Throughout the two-parter, Donna has been spacing out to the sound of a heartbeat. This sound draws her to the hand itself, which she reaches out for, the body part suddenly forming a brand new Doctor out of nowhere, pushing a button to save the time machine just as the actual Doctor believes it burns up. I feel like this is in the wrong order. The moment would have been a lot more powerful if the audience hadn't seen the TARDIS survive, but because we know about the naked Doctor saving the ship, we know there's nothing to worry about, so we aren't able to feel the Doctor's pain and anger as effectively as we would have otherwise. So it's a bit of a disappointment in the editing department. Jack then gets himself exterminated as part of a wider plan, since he knows the other two can't escape, which I think is a clever use of this gimmick, especially because Rose doesn't know, which is ironic, as she gave him this power in the first place. Although I do think his resurrection here is weird, because he's able to stay completely still, rather than basically every other time where he comes up gasping for air. I just think it's a bit of a weird plot hole that isn't really consistent with his other resurrections. Floating in the relative safety of space, the Metacrisis Doctor explains his existence to Donna, with a good bit of comedy now that he has her sass and snarkiness. Indeed, it turns out this new Doctor is actually part human and part Time Lord. I guess you could probably say on his mother's side because Donna was involved in his creation. He has part of her inside him, so he can see through her eyes and understand why she's the way she is. Episodes like Planet of the Youth showed us there's a real compassionate undercurrent to Donna. Her aggressive front is just that a front. However, the Doctor can clearly see just how little she thinks of herself despite her being special. It's a cathartic moment because it's kind of like Agatha Christie in Unicorn and the Wasp, where the writer held herself in such a low esteem, believing she was a failure and she wasn't special even though the audience knew she was. This is similar here, because as the viewer we've seen all the special things Donna has done, all the reasons she should be proud of what she's accomplished, but she still can't see it. I think it goes all the way back to how Donna was raised. As shown in series 4 and specifically turn left, Sylvia has always been the one putting Donna down and giving her this feeling of inferiority. So it's a good way to illustrate just how far the companion has come and developed over her time in the TARDIS. Although I really don't like that they then act like her life with the Doctor was destiny. Why can't things just be coincidences every now and then? Meanwhile, Martha reluctantly teleports to Germany with the mysterious Osterhagen key, and I'll always love how goofy it is that the Daleks are speaking German. Kind of taking the whole Nazi allegory a bit too far, but it's just so tonally off that I can't help but love it. Martha then has a conversation in the native tongue with the last guard who has stayed at her post. I think it's a fantastic touch that this whole conversation is in Deutsch and not English, because neither the Doctor nor the TARDIS is there to do the translation wizardry we're used to seeing. It also shows how great Martha is because she's fluent in this foreign language. It most likely derives from her time travelling the world between Sound of Drums and Last of the Time Laws. She walked across the entire planet, so she should have learned some languages to help spread her message. Also, it's yet another reason she's a million times better than Rose, who can only speak English, whilst Martha probably knows multiple languages by this point. I mentioned earlier in the review about the mysterious Osterhagen key which struck fear into the hearts of Martha and Harriet Jones, but we get another sense of its terror here, as the German woman begs her not to use it, even trying to hold her at gunpoint. 
All these reactions to the key do a wonderful job setting up what it is, really establishing that this is a last resort option with very bad implications, so it keeps you on the edge of your seat waiting to find out what this all means. Davros then rolls up to taunt the Doctor only for the Time Lord to mock him for being relegated to the basement whilst the Supreme Dalek runs the show. Even at the end, with his TARDIS and companion seemingly lost, he can try to fight back with his words, although Davros easily shrugs this off because he knows the Doctor's tricks all too well. Well, before he weirdly says Rose is his to do as he pleases. That's not a visual I want, thanks Russell. I'd even take Jabber and Leia over this because Jabber is one sexy beast, you have to admit. The Doctor and Rose are reunited with Dalek Khan, now this insane oracle. I really like how Khan is used in the story. Not only did he break the time lock as established earlier, but he also has this undeniable knowledge of events to come, like Rose in turn left. His prophecies have already started to come true, so you take stock in his prediction here about a death to come. All these events cause the Doctor to show his anger, which Davros again taunts him with. Davros knows his adversary well, he saw the rage of the Time Lord in the Time War, aware of the anger he so desperately tries to hide from his companions. Time after time the Doctor had angry outbursts in this era of the show, and this is a good way to build upon that, how he's hiding his true colours so to speak. This whole setup is revealed to be the so called reality bomb, which the Daleks are testing on humans, including a group Jackie is stuck in, Sarah and Mickey unable to rescue her. What a bold move to kill off such a big character in this episode. A massive series finale like this always needs at least one main character to kick the bucket, so I really appreciate them doing it here, adding another death to the toll started with Harriet Jones. Wait, what, what, what's that? Jackie, Jackie just teleports out and survives only to contribute literally nothing to the rest of the episode? Oh, right, okay. Even though the reality bomb doesn't claim the life of a single important character, I like the dramatic weight. These striking visuals of all the planets lighting up, the Doctor begging Davros to stop as all these innocent people are disintegrated and reduced to, well, not even atoms. The CGI hasn't aged well for the actual disintegrations, but the planets all look incredible. The reactions of both Doctors selling the sickening reality of the weapon. It kind of shows the predicament Davies had put himself in with his trend of upping the ante every single finale. He ended up at the point where the only way to increase the stakes was to threaten all of reality itself, which is almost too big of a threat. It would always be so hard to pay this all off. For some reason, the Daleks have incinerators, which Captain Jack manages to escape from, meeting up with his old friend Mickey Smith, proving to be the best buddy cop duo we never got. I just love these two together, and it's a huge shame they only had sparse interactions. Big finish, I'm begging you. Why make Lady Christina when you can make Mickey and Captain Jack, or Mickey and the Preachers, or Mickey and Torchwood? Damn it, I, I, I just want more Mickey. However, Sarah then brings out a warp star, which she was told she could use for the end of days. No, not normal. Not the Torchwood episode. This is a weapon our protagonists have to fight back, an explosion waiting to happen. It's a good way to involve this group in the story, actually giving them something to do, although yeah, Jackie doesn't really have any reason to be involved. And on top of this weapon, even the Metacrisis Doctor is tinkering away, making his own piece of kit to utilise the sacred power of gun. Like Davros and Khan say, these are the children of time, the Doctor's warriors. Similar to the Warp Star, the Osterhog and Key will detonate a chain of conveniently placed nuclear bombs to rip the Earth apart, essentially the old trick of you can't kill me if I kill myself first. Whilst this concept seems a bit ridiculous, I think it does a lot to show how truly hopeless the situation is. There's literally no other way to fight back, so they have to turn to such a dramatic last resort. I also appreciate Martha's spin on the plan, since destroying Earth would be a way to stop the reality bomb, if only for a short while, because it would prevent them reaching full power. The groups come onto the intercom, and I love the confrontation between Sarah Jane and Davros, the latter taunting her because this is too perfect for him. The cherry on top because he gets to vanquish this woman who helped stop him right at the beginning. I guess you could say, everything's coming up Davros. We then get the highlight of this second episode, Davros exposing how the Doctor is all pacifist and anti-weapon, yet uses others to do it for him. This is one of those amazing moments where the villain is completely right. 
revealing how the Doctor has turned all these companions into soldiers. Donna mentioned it in Santaran's strategy, but it's here that we see the true extent of it, just how many people have become weapons for him. Even Sarah Jane, who claimed to avoid Torchwood because of the guns, has produced this doomsday weapon Jack is now brandishing. Like Harriet Jones said, they're the Doctor's secret army. This scene always gives me chills. Dream of a normal death playing as the Doctor remembers everyone who has died in his name. From the Forest of Cheem to the Hostess in Midnight, everywhere he goes, someone sacrifices themselves for his cause. This war by proxy almost. Usually I hate flashbacks and this is one of the most flashback heavy moments in Doctor Who history, but it is a strong use of them, driving home the loss and sacrifice, the sheer scale of it all. Obviously the Doctor doesn't want these people to sacrifice themselves, but the character can't help it. It's the effect they have and they continue to be guilty of it to this day. Davros is completely right, and that's the scariest part of this moment, highlighting just how dangerous the Doctor can be, even though they fight in the name of morality and good. However, to stop the moral conundrum of these doomsday weapons, they're all just taken prisoner. It makes everything seem so hopeless, as the reality bomb gears up ready to destroy all of existence itself. Nothing the Doctor says can stop this, as Davros maniacally revels in the ultimate victory of the Daleks. It's a very strong moment, even the sudden appearance of the Metacrisis Doctor and Donna comes crashing down, as Davros shoots out force lightning at them both, finally eliminating anyone who can possibly chase him down now. Wait, but what's that? By god, it's Dodo here to save the day! The subwave network contacted her! Wow! Jokes aside, this is where the episode starts to really fall apart in most people's eyes. They built the stakes up so high, and took away all strategies and weapons to fight back. This powerful sense of dread as all seems lost, just for Donna to press a button and shut the whole thing down. This isn't even an exaggeration, she literally says, That button there? I often try to go against the grain when it comes to hated things like this, but I have to agree with the masses here that this is an incredibly weak solution. It was always going to be tough to stop a threat established as, well, unstoppable, but this oversimplifies it far too much because even the Doctor has to put in more effort than this. Why would one random button in the vault be able to stop the entire reality bomb? Davros has no power or actual influence down here, so why would he have a big cancel button? It makes no sense. It's not even an explainable deus ex machina like the space jesus stuff in series 3, this is just there, completely out of nowhere. It's fun that Donna easily dispatches of Davros and his Dalek cronies, cheerfully spouting techno babble, but again, there's no logic here. Why would this console control so much? Why can it completely immobilise the Daleks? It just makes no sense. Even with Catherine Tate being a joy to watch in this moment, it's still a bit ridiculous because it's bordering on absurd. I'm also in two minds about her being the other half of the Meta Crisis, taking the Time Lord side. On the one hand, it's a great escalation of the power of the Companion, paying off the whole Dr. Donna thing in Planet of the Ood, but it also devalues Donna's own agency. She stops being special because she's Donna Noble, now suddenly being special because she's the Dr. Donna. I just personally feel as though it's a step back for her character journey. However, this scene does mirror the earlier scene where she accidentally explained how she could save the day. I'm just a ten. Sure, I am fighting under words with my neck. <laughs> Fat look, good that is now. Do you know I ever tell you? Best 10 pin chizik. Per it's cathartic as all the characters mount a proper fight back this time, each contributing something. Well, unless you're Jackie, who just kind of stands there. It's all very triumphant, Captain Jack getting to blow up the Supreme Dalek, just like that one Dalek he blew up in Parting of the Ways. It also turns out that Khan has been manipulating events the entire time, betraying his own kind because he's seen the horror and destruction they've always caused. This is essentially him admitting he was wrong to overthrow the hybrid sect. Sex developed a similar disdain for the species, how their pursuit of purity would only ever leave them in darkness. Khan didn't see it at the time, but his eyes, well, eye, has been open now that his travel through the time lock showed him the entire history and future of the Daleks. He realised the truth about them, fittingly decreeing, a statement which would come back in force with the War Doctor in Day of the Doctor five years later. The true last two survivors of the Time War both stumbling onto the same conclusion, declaring death to the Daleks and Time Lords alike. Indeed, the Metacrisis Doctor decides the only solution is mass genocide, blowing up every stinking Dalek despite Donna's protests. 
This is a very shocking moment, reflected by the actual Doctor's anger and disgust. It's no lie that something needed to be done about this new Dalek Empire, but the Metacrisis Doctor didn't even give them a choice, no offer or bargain like the Doctor had offered in Evolution, where he planned to take the hybrids to create their own planet of the Daleks. I've said this before, but I feel as though this stems from the timing of the hand being cut off, since it wasn't that long after the Ninth Doctor was faced with a similar opportunity, hearkening back to that incarnation and how his Time War memories influenced him. You were born in battle, full of blood and anger and revenge. Remind you of someone? Even though the Metacrisis Doctor has all the current memories of the Doctor, I've always believed that he still has that time or desire to finally destroy his arch enemies this way. The actual Doctor has grown and somewhat moved on, but the Metacrisis Doctor maintains the rawness of the Time War, fueling his choice here, along with that humanity preventing him from rising above this extinction. It's also phenomenal that Davros names the Doctor Destroyer of Worlds, holding him accountable for what the Metacrisis Doctor did, because at the end of the day, it is still him. So Davros is, again, right. Yes, the Doctor has unraveled the Dalek's master plan, but he has caused even more death and destruction. Another the genocide to add to the list and the character will always have to deal with that. You made me. However, despite sending almost all of the planets back to their places and times, Earth still remains because of course it does. This means the Doctor has to personally tow the Earth back, leading to one final great usage of the ensemble cast. Each person having a part to play, even the spin-off teams on Earth who had literally zero presence in the second part until now. This all leads to one of my favourite moments of the Davies era as all of these faces were have come to love over the course of three years fly the TARDIS together, Song of Freedom playing. It's just so happy. It always chokes me up because it shows how far the show has come since that opening sequence in Rose back in 2005. It's a personification of the joy and togetherness the show brings, this celebration of the era itself, a truly beautiful and special visual. This was Doctor Who, my Doctor Who. I grew up with all these characters rattling around the universe in their own ways and and here they are at last, all together. The story itself didn't really have much to do with most of these characters, but it's all worth it for this final flight, this acknowledgement of the show being what it is. I know it's a cheesy scene, but regardless of what your thoughts on Journey's End, it's impossible to not simply adore this climax, because it's incredibly heroic in every way. Like I said, this was Doctor Who for me, so it's always incredibly powerful to revisit this scene, essentially my entire childhood summed up in one single sequence. And also I think Sarah sums up the magic of the show with this one line. You act like such a lonely man. But look at you, you've got the biggest family on earth. The Doctor then watches all of his friends ride off into the sunset since they all have their own lives now. Back in Stolen Earth he was so happy to see what these people did without him, but now there's a bittersweet tinge to it because he knows he doesn't belong in their lives anymore. Sarah has Luke, Jack, Martha and Mickey have Torchwood, Rose and Jackie have their family in their own world. They don't need their old friend anymore and he knows he'll have to set off again all alone and you can see it in his eyes. Like the title of the episode says, it's Jen his end. The most underrated departure is Mickey, who has nothing in Pete's world anymore. I guess he fell out with Jake then. This is a character who constantly faded into the background because everyone else was written to be more important, but he was always such a strong character who had a clear journey. He never needed the Doctor to realise his worth, quietly becoming the biggest badass of them all, which the Doctor respects in the end, a real look of pride at seeing how much the young man has developed and achieved. It's nice to see him return to the Prime Universe, especially because he runs to catch up with Jack and Martha, joining Torchwood. I'll never stop asking Big Finish to release box sets set between this and Children of Earth, where Martha and Mickey are part of the team. God damn it, Nick Briggs, do it, I'm begging you. Then the TARDIS returns to Bad Wolf Bay to take Rose and Jackie home, a mirror of Doomsday, the old companion once again having to say goodbye to the Doctor forever, as she's left behind in this parallel world. However, this time there's the Metacrisis Doctor, who they can't leave unsupervised because of their good old war crimes. Much like everything else regarding the Metacrisis Doctor, I'm in two minds about all this. On one hand, allowing Rose to finally settle down with the Doctor is the completion of her arc, a second chance with him where they can have the life they wish they could have had, able to grow old together. You can see how much the actual Doctor loves Rose for bringing him out of the darkness of the Time War, so he knows she can redeem the Metacrisis Doctor who still has that darkness. That's me when we first met and you made me better
it wraps up their relationship, but that's where the other hand comes into play. I don't like their relationship. Davies proves to be the biggest Tenro shipper of them all, confirming the Doctor loves her back, answering the lingering question fans had at the end of Doomsday. It's a bit of a cop out to create an entire incarnation of the Doctor just so Rose can have a happy ending, really taking a roundabout way of closing her storyline, but I at least like how the actual Doctor has to face the pain of that not being him. When you think about it, he's basically cucking himself with himself, something Moffat would be very proud of. However, this happy ending gives way to an overwhelmingly sad one. Donna continues to act all Time Lord, the Doctor looking on with that tragic, sad look in his eye. You immediately know there's something off about the situation. Which is confirmed when Donna's mind just breaks. The superseding the binary, 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 I'm fine. I love how Catherine Tate sells this moment, almost like someone with extreme ADHD, because Donna has all these Time Lord thoughts racing too quick for her to keep up with. You can see her pain because they both know she shouldn't exist. It's physically impossible. This moment has always been critically lauded, and it's definitely justified. It's one of the most tragic companion departures of all time, because it's a fate worse than death. She's losing her identity. You can understand why she pleads so desperately to escape this. Like we saw at the end of Doctor's Daughter, she wanted to travel forever, but now she's being forced to go back to that life she hated so much, no longer having any memory of the woman she became. It undoes her character development, and that's the beauty of it. She came so far as a person, and became someone truly special and amazing, but here she loses it all, back to that life of temping and feeling inferior. She saved entire civilizations, but she'll never know and that's the tragedy of it all. Dalek Khan foretold a companion dying, but this is much worse, a complete loss of self and there's nothing the Doctor can do. In fact, he's the one that has to do it, which makes it so much more painful for him, almost like he's executing his own companion. Although I will say it was sadder when this all happened to Jamie and Zoe. That was a lot better because the Doctor had even less power in that situation. And it wasn't like Donna where it was absolutely necessary because they could have still survived with these memories. The knife is twisted further into your gut once the Doctor has to explain everything to to Wilf and Sylvia. If you'd managed to stop crying once the memory wipe happened, Wilf's reaction starts those tears right back up again, because he points out that loss of character development. I've said a number of times throughout these reviews, but Wilf is Donna's biggest fan. He never gives up on her and always sees the potential within. He could clearly see how much better she was with the Doctor, and now he'll have to always watch her as she lives that old life, and this truly pains him. Which Cribbins reflects perfectly here. It's also great that the Doctor shuts down Sylvia, who has constantly been insufferable throughout the series. He finally gets that moment to silence her. She was the most important woman in the whole wide universe. She still is. Then maybe you should tell her that once in a while. The Doctor then sadly leaves as Donna returns to her usual obnoxious self. It's here that the Doctor reflects upon how everyone else has someone now, he's all alone again. Despite what Sarah says, he is the loneliest man, and losing Donna didn't really help that. Wilf again steals the scene with his heartfelt promise to look up every night and think of the Doctor, saluting his friend goodbye. It always brings a tear to the eye because Wilf is so pure and lovable. You hate to see him upset, but here he is with his eyes watering, and you just can't help but feel so sad for him. The Doctor then stands in his TARDIS all alone, a contrast from the packed and friendly atmosphere of the towing scene. It's the first series finale where the character is truly alone and there's no distraction. In Doomsday, Donna appeared seconds later, and and just after Martha left, the space titanic crashed into the ship. But here, there's nothing. Just loneliness. It's so much more powerful than the original ending of Cybermen appearing in the ship, because it's the perfect illustration of that deep loneliness of the Tenth Doctor. A wonderful way to close out this blockbuster final series finale for him. The Series 4 finale is a tricky one, because it's a game of two halves. One half is absolutely incredible, and the other is messy and inconsistent. You won't win any prizes for guessing which is which. That being said, I don't think the two-parter is as bad as a lot of people say. It's so high stakes and intense throughout, setting the bar for the most ambitious story the show has ever crafted, paying off a lot of plot threads, not just the Series 4 story arc. It has to be commended because of the sheer scale of it all. The Stolen Earth is the perfect first part. 
building the Daleks up incredibly well. However, the second part is a disappointing payoff, not really reaching the same heights. It's for this reason I'd have to give the two-parter an A on the Series 4 tier list. If it was individual, Stolen Earth would be an S, but Journey's End is more of a B, so it mixes together for that A rank. There's still a lot to like about Journey's End, some absolutely wonderful character moments and that incredible ending, but the solution to the Reality Bomb is a letdown and Davros doesn't really do a whole lot in the story, coming across a bit too much like a traditional shouty villain. There's almost too much going on, so I feel like a three-parter would have served the finale a lot better. Just just like my main criticism of Series 2's finale. However, the best thing about this story is that it just screams Series Finale. Everything about it is event television, from the music to the directing, along with all the returning monsters and characters. It's spectacular to behold, and I think the length of this video reflects just how much there is stuffed into this climactic story. Donna's exit is handled superbly in my opinion, along with the ending wrapping up the Davies era, sending all these characters off now they have their own lives without the Doctor. It's not just a series finale, it's an era finale in a way, taking this gigantic scale so that End of Time could have the freedom to be a bit more character based. This series 4 finale attempts to sum up and define Doctor Who, which sometimes it excels at and sometimes completely fails at. Ultimately, the biggest strength of the two-parter is also its biggest weakness, because it's too big for its own good, but I sure as hell enjoy it nonetheless, no matter the shortcomings. And I'd just like to give a very special thank you to my Gold Level patrons, Alex Marston, Calvin, Daniel Shilato, Franz Horn aka Lime Vortex, John, Ross, Stephanie Miller, and William Jewell. Thank you so much for your support.